Uh, thank you very much, for everyone, for coming here today. Um, my name is Oliver. Uh, I'm the Mars Rover Project Manager at McGill Robotics, which is uh, a university student design team uh, at McGill University from Montreal in Canada. And I'm a third year mechanical engineering student. And uh, my name is Duo. I'm a fourth year mechanical engineering student, and I'm the mechanical So. Uh, Miguel Robotics is a huge umbrella organization of students who are brought together to design robots for international competitions. Uh, this year, we actually topped the record by recruiting more than 100 additional members, and they're not even all on the picture here. Uh, these members were recruited from uh, the arts faculty, from the management faculty, uh, science faculty, and of course, from the engineering faculty, and all brought together to design various robots for different projects. Uh, one of these projects was the AUV, or Autonomous on the Water Vehicle. Another one was the Mars Rover, and there's a smaller business team uh, in our group who's taking care of the team's finance uh, and marketing strategies. So here's the AUV for this year. I'm just going to quickly introduce it, just to let you know what's, what's going on in our team. So um, this is an Autonomous on the, on the Water Vehicle. It's for the RoboSub competition in San Diego. Uh, and basically what it does is that we just place it in the water, it goes on the water, and fully autonomously it, it, uh, it accomplishes a few tasks. Uh, some of them are just crossing a gate, others are shooting torpedoes, uh, avoiding obstacles, locating an acoustic finger, and much more. Another of these projects is, of course, the Mars rover, uh, which we're going to talk about during this presentation. And finally, uh, we have our business team. As I said, they're taking care of uh, sponsorship, accounting, we also have a program they actually place, made in, put in place uh, to perform outreach with our students of the Montreal area uh, so that we can uh, let them try smaller robots we have, especially for these purposes, and also sometimes try our bigger robots like the Mars rover. So the University Rover Challenge. So about a year ago, I w I've been looking for a while at this competition, and it was reflecting a lot of the values, uh, well, my passion I had for robotics and space exploration. And I couldn't believe that no one else at this university was uh, sharing these same passions. So this is why I started the team uh, about exactly a year ago. And, uh, and ever since, we've recruited a lot of members. So as you, uh, as you might guess it, this presentation will be uh, pretty much about uh, our experience at designing for the first year, the first rover. Uh, which is named Artemis, and also the successes and the failures. Sometimes a few of them were spectacular. Uh, we've had along the way, and also our experience at the University Rover Challenge, and how we learn from these experiences for next year. So I know uh, Mr. Kevin Sloan, who is going to be, uh, who's the URC director, University Rover Challenge director. He will be talking about this competition uh, a little bit later today, I think right after us. Uh, but I just wanted to say a few words about it, just to put you in the environment of what we need to do. So uh, it takes place at MDRS, which is the Mars Desert Research Station. And usually this place is used for, uh, for research purposes and simulation of crews as if they were on Mars. So they're all living together in the main habitat and sometimes performing uh, missions outside of it. For, and they're all together for, these, uh, for a few weeks. Um, when we get there for the University Rover Challenge, um, we have a few tasks to do. So we're placed in a closed environment so that we can see the robot. So, and from this, we'll be able to operate it uh, over uh, wireless communication. One of the tasks we need to do is uh, a service panel task. So we, there are knobs, levers, switches that we need to activate in a specific order uh, in order to turn on uh, uh, a blower that will inflate a balloon in the back. Uh, there's also a, an astronaut assistance task in which we need to pick up a few objects, sometimes unusual, but like tools we have here on the picture, and bring them to remote locations to uh, ultimately assist astronauts who would need these tools. Uh, we have a terrain traversal task, like right here, uh, in which the rovers, it's basically a stress test for your drive system. You have, to go, you have to go to checkpoints in specific places in the desert, and sometimes to get there, you have to go, you have to climb up a steep hill, sometimes you have to go through uh, a field of rocks. Um, and you're, just, you're always worrying a little bit, but uh, usually things go through it. And finally, we have a sample return task. So the rover needs to survey an entire area and pick up one or a few samples of its choice, perform uh, biological and geological analysis, 
on board the rover, and once it comes back to the, mar to the station, uh, the team needs to do further analysis with it to ultimately determine if there was life in this sample or um, if this sample has the right condition for life to develop on it. So here we are. So uh, we're in early October, uh, a little bit less than a year ago. Uh, we just recruited members uh, for this new team. We're now about 50 on the team, but only about five of us have been doing robotics in the past. Uh, we have very limited materials, even though we're within Mega Robotics. For this, for this specific project, we have nothing right now at this stage. Uh, we need some financial resources because our university is only providing us about 10% of our financials. We need to find uh, external sponsors, work very closely with the business team for it. And uh, we have a very tight schedule ahead. Uh, you know, we need to design the rover. Uh, we need to uh, uh, go through the manufacturing phase, assemble it, test, test, and test a lot. And uh, in the end, we're hoping to be accepted and that the rover pleases us and also pleases the URC judges so we can go compete in the field and then compete among very experienced participants, which is a very rewarding experience. And that's, that's on top of studying for school and studying for exams. And uh, it's, it's a pretty tight schedule. So how do we do that? So of course, we planned a little bit beforehand. So we had a very specific team structure. Uh, our team was divided into three divisions. We had the mechanical division, the electrical division, and the software division. And each of these divisions were further divided into sections. Um, and this was very, this allowed us to have very good communication across the whole team. Uh, it allowed us, allowed us to have a very efficient work distribution. And finally, um, all the discussions that were supposed to be maintained for the systems level of the whole design uh, were handled by uh, sections and divisions working together. So it was really a team that was united, but also had specific division to be very efficient. Also, we had a very tight <laughs> schedule. Um, at the very beginning, we found very important to have a conceptual design phase. This is where we just brainstorm all the ideas that can go through our mind and evaluating the feasibility of these and the non-feasibility of others. Uh, look at current designs, try to get in touch with other teams because they have very valuable information about what we should expect from the environment when we get there. Um, and then uh, we start designing, actually just make the CAD model of it for mechanical, do an actual model for all the custom printed circuit boards we'll do with our electrical team. And the software just, team just starts the, uh, building the software that we'll need for the rover and start simulations. And then we go through the manufacturing phase. We're starting to have materials coming in. We can start building prototypes, just have a proof of concept that it actually does work. And then we have a huge period that is allocated for integrating everything together and test. And this is where a problem occurs, and that's a normal process, but we need a lot of time for it because testing is super important. So I'll let Duo detail a little bit more, uh, talk a little bit more about the mechanical design of Artemis. Now? Good. All right. Um, all right. Thank you, Oliver. Um, so basically, um, I was in charge of a lot of the mechanical design of, of this rover. Um, let's start with um, a rather interesting uh, suspension design. As you can see, um, it is very similar to a, rock, a conventional rocket boogie, which is something you would see on um, the Curiosity rover. However, it, um, the difference is that it is a, a linear rocker boogie, what we call, um, or four, four bar linkage rocker boogie. Basically what it does is it's able to overcome some dangerous moments and um, prevent overturning, which is uh, a very common problem that conventional rocker boogies encounter. Next you can see um, the arm, which is a six degree uh, a freedom arm. It's got two linear actuators and a bunch of DC motors on there. Um, it's a ve very dexterous arm and um, the gripper design is particularly interesting as well. Um, and yeah, finally we have um, so 
you, you, can, you can tell that a lot of the systems here we've built ourselves. Um, some of the machining, we've practically used all sorts of manufacturing um, methods. So either laser cutting, aluminum, or CNCing, or conventional machining. Um, even 3D printing, if you can look at the camera here, the, the entire camera case is 3D printed. And a lot of our motor casing here is also 3D printed plastic. Furthermore, we have um, an important uh, part of uh, any rocker boogie design, which is the differential, which basically transmits um, the height difference uh, it encounters from one side to the other. Um, it's not assembled right now because it was kind of a pain to assemble it. And finally, um, our science box. It's capable of um, taking in soil through the funnel and analyzing um, presence of water, um, the pH, and also uh, presence of uh, ions. I'll hand it over to you now to <laughs> talk about some of the electrical and software aspects. All right, thank you, Du. So, oh yeah, and just before switching to the uh, electrical division, uh, we have a little video just showing uh, how the, rock, uh, how the uh, actual rocker boogie, but we actually like the suspension on here, but you can see the lambda in the back, the four bars mechanism, how it works when it crosses a few obstacles. So, you can really see it always keeps contact with the ground, it's very efficient, and we can also change our rover to a four wheel configuration for uh, much more uh, for much more uh, mobility on the field, which is very useful for tasks such as a surfacing uh, surfacing panel and also uh, sample collection. So for the electrical design, uh, we went we, we we tried to go big this year. Uh, from the first year, we've uh, actually designed our own custom PCBs. Uh, this goes from power distribution, it goes to motor control, brushless, and brush motor control. Also, our own interface boards. Uh, we actually just got the chips, programmed them to a very, <laughs> very low level, um, and it was a huge task. So you can see these are the final boards we had, and they were all plugging into. You can see all the pads here. They were all plugging into a backplane, and this backplane actually allowed us to save more than 45 feet of cable inside the rover, like the way we had configured it. So it was very useful on this point and uh, very efficient. But we ran into some problems with it. Uh, which we'll talk a little bit uh, a bit further into the presentation. Our software design, uh, we were actually helped by a few features. Uh, I'm just going to mention a few of them. Uh, we have encoders on uh, three of the joints of the arm, which gave us actual real feedback on the actual position of the arm. And we also have a few cameras all around the rover. There's one main in, in the top of the tower. Uh, there's one on each side of the rover. And they're actually aligned with both of the lines of the wheels so that whenever we're about to run into an obstacle, we can clearly see if we're clearing the obstacle or not. Also, there's usually uh, another camera which we unfortunately broke last week. Uh, we couldn't have it, uh, but we'll replace it. It's basically a, a wide-angle camera in the front of the rover, and it was at the level of the base plate, so that's also an indicator for us to see if we're, whether we're clearing an obstacle or not. And also, it's capable, because it's a little bit under the base plate, we can see the two front wheels, so if there's any problem, uh, any places the rover got stuck just because you know, the environment was a little bit different, maybe there was a little hole we didn't see, we could see it with these cameras. Um, this is uh, an actual, uh, you can let clearly see it on the screen here, but it's the interface uh, without all the camera feedback for the control station. So we have, um, we have usually a, a set of data. This, is a, this was halfway into the year. But we also have a mini map here. And we are helped by an IMU and a GPS on board the rover to tell us the, its actual position. And just trace a dynamic map onto the, onto the, the, of the terrain we're traversing. And we have the, op the ability to drop checkpoints on our map. So if we're surveying a terrain for uh, collecting a sample, we see an area of interest. But we'd like to go uh, explore further. We can just drop a, ch a checkpoint and take a, a picture of the area go explore, and if we're not satisfied, we just go back to this checkpoint and just keep on doing what we were doing at this place. Because the software was not, uh, we didn't have the rover from the beginning of the year, it was very hard for software to test uh, their algorithms. So this is why we've created simulation environments. Very simple, but they were, they were extremely useful 
um, we were actually just having a control station just like we would have at competition, but instead of having an actual real rover, we had a simulated rover indicating uh, the orientation of the wheels and also orientation of the arm. And that screenshot was taken when the arm was not very well configured. It was actually upside down in the software, but you get the point. And ultimately, after a lot of testing, we get to a rover. And we were extremely happy to be able to be selected for the University Rover Challenge, and we made it there. So that's a little pride we had just before going there. So we were very happy about it. So I'm going to let, I'm going to hand it back to Duo, and it's going to talk about some experience we got there and uh, our team values and how we learned so much. Um, I would like to just give you um, an idea of how MIGO Robotics works, uh, what our team dynamics are and our core values. Um, basically, I, I would like to show you this by recalling one of those problems that we've had uh, during the competition. Um, basically, this, the way this story goes is um, on the last day before leaving for competition, okay, our, one of our we were, we were doing a routine battery swap and one of our 24 volt batteries accidentally landed on one of our five volt ones. And this basically blew our entire, um, all of our control boards. Now, since it was the last day, uh, we couldn't do much. We just shipped it to Utah and hoped that we could fix it when we got there. Now, um, basically, once we got there, we worked tirelessly, day and night, trying to, to, try to make this thing work. And um, to some degree of success, actually. So after one or two days, we were able to get mo some, a lot of the systems back up and running. We were able to get um, some of the sensor boards, um, power distribution, and even the brushed um, DC motors controllers. However, we just could not figure out um, how to bring back to life our brushless DC motors, and this meant that we cannot drive our rover. This was a very dire situation for us. <laughs> so um, basically, um, our electrical team spent day and night trying to figure this out. We had a lot of theories. Um, one of the main reasons we think it wasn't working was due to the dry uh, environment of um, Utah, which we hadn't really foreseen. and this might have potentially made it easier um, uh, for bridging between uh, the flux we were using on our boards. Other potential reasons could have been um, some dust or maybe static that could have built up. But um, in the end, um, it wasn't working. And we headed to uh, the first day of the competition, which is astronaut assistance with no drive. However, we were not um, faltered by this. In fact, we showed up, we were very positive. We tried to learn as much as we could about that first, um, that first task, you know, how the courses usually run. We even talked to a lot of the teams that were there. And we came back that night, not in despair, but we just had to get this working. We were, we were still on, <laughs> really worked very hard. And, and we tried so many things. The, the, just to give you an example, the electrical team came to us and said, you know, maybe we could get two brushless motor controllers working. Fine. So we basically converted the whole thing into a four wheel uh, system with two free spinning in the back. After some time, it actually ended up being that maybe only one brushless motor controller was going to work. No problem. We turned it into a tricycle. <laughs> OK. Um, yes. Um, OK, and at, at the end, um, even then, uh, it wasn't, one wasn't going to work. But that didn't stop us either. We had some brush DC motors that we brought, so we converted the whole thing into DC drive. <laughs> and, and in the end, um, the, um, basically, the, I guess the moral of the story is that we, we never give up as a team. We work together, and we, there's a lot of positive things we took out of this. We were able to get the arm working, and that gave us that scored us a lot of um, a, a couple of points for um, panel servicing, and our science team did a phenomenal job in um, obtaining 100% of all of the possible points they could have obtained without 
the drive system. In the end, we learned a lot. We worked together as a team. Nobody blamed anybody, um, and we came out very positive. So now I'm going to hand it back to um, you. So I know there's about um, maybe three minutes left. I'm just going to close it, and if you guys have any questions, you could ask them. Yeah, it was a great team picture because this was after the very successful day we had at science and service panel task. We're very happy about it. One of the things the team did when they came back from competition was that uh, we just took our sleeves up and we started working and just trying to figure out what went wrong, what went good. It's very important to go through the, very, the good successes of the team because there's been a lot, but there's been also a lot of spectacular failures we've had along the year and some failures as well at competition. And, uh, and the team just try to tackle everything we could uh, do better for next year. Um, a part of the team actually had started working on the new rover just for next year. So, you know, we have about a, a lot of months in advance uh, f uh, compared to last year. And uh, another part of the team just worked on revamping the whole electrical system of Artemis. So uh, you can see some new, we, we used much more off the shelf components, but the wiring was done by us in house. Um, and doing this has a lot of uh, very positive outcomes. For example, uh, we're actually going to the European Rover Challenge in three weeks in Poland. And all what we actually have the whole rover working, we have the arm working independently, now we're just working on the integration. So this is why we cannot run it as a whole system tonight. Uh, but we're getting there. Uh, also, uh, it will be an incredible testing platform. Software wish they could have a robot uh, early last year, but they couldn't test the, their algorithms un until uh, a few weeks before the critical design review is hand handed in for our selection at the University Rover Challenge. And also will be very useful uh, for teaching new members to come in because this year we focus a lot on recruiting very young members and it's very useful. Uh, well, we had actually to train them so that's a little bit more time consuming but it's good for uh, the rest of the team uh, for the continuity. And having a rover just there will be good for the, even for the returning members to look at different systems but also for the new members uh, to come in and learn from this rover. So uh, just to close, um, we're really hoping uh, to come back next year for the University Rover Challenge 2016, just to show to the whole community how much this team has learned at its first, very first experience at the University Rover Challenge and how much it has evolved and learned from its present experiences. So thank you very much for your attention. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so for now, it's all remotely function. We had some plans to try semi-autonomous uh, functions, but you know, we cannot raise the step too high for the first year. Um, but there's a lot of things we can do autonomously that would be very useful. For example, whenever we're collecting a sample and we want to analyze it, we can just automate the whole uh, procedure. You know, it just turns back, drop it into the science apparatus, and just run, runs the whole uh, uh, procedure to analyze the sample. Another thing would be uh, if it ever, if communication just cut because everything is wireless, uh, there's a map within the rover that was dynamically built as it was going on the terrain. And it would be very useful for the rover just to step back following this map it has traced until communication is reestablished. So all these mini autonomous functions that could help us a lot, actually. So that's a plan for next year. Yes? My favorite part, so I was the project manager, so I worked a lot at a systems level. Uh, so, you know, just working close. I, I'm a mechanical person, so I worked much more into the mechanical aspect, but I worked a lot with the electrical and software people. One of the things that I loved working on onto the rover uh, was actually bringing the drive system together. So I helped a lot the, the drive system section because uh, it, it was kind of innovative. They've done a great job with the differential we had. Uh, usually, you know, there's a lot of twist in the rods of the differentials, so in the end, it's not very reliable. This one was rock solid, and we're planning to make an even better one next year by shortening the links. So I, I was very happy of the drive system because it was it was a drive system we didn't see that much at this competition. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, sorry, I'll go after you. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. And actually, yeah. Yes, and for the plan B, we had you know, these, this fancy electrical system. Maybe we tried to run a little bit this year before trying to walk. But uh, our plan B was actually our prototype boards that we've made a few months before, which were all working super fine. And when we got, got to the competition, everything stopped working. We were just touching something, and we were charged with static you know, at the hotel. And we were actually just discharging ourselves into the board. So we had to buy aluminum foil at the, at the store and just pull aluminum foil everywhere and grounded it to the ground of the wall of the hotel. And at this point, because it was extremely dry, so we learned a lot from it. But you know, we managed to make some things work. But we learned a lot from it, yeah, <laughs> because everything was very compact from then. Uh, yeah, I'll just go with Sir here. Oh, OK. Thank you. Yes? Yes? Sure. Yeah. Oh, yes, good question, sorry. Yeah, it's a very good question. So for the software question, um, we were using Ubuntu, and each of our nodes were written in C++ and in Python. And we were using ROS, a robotic operating system, to bring everything together, to just ease all the communications across all the nodes. It's, it's magic. So uh, this, is, this was for the software question. For the DARPA question, uh, we were, it's actually a funny, it's funny that you're asking this, because we were looking at some of uh, these features uh, a week ago with some of the friends. And um, there's actually a robot that is being designed by NASA, uh, which is Robonaut. And uh, it, you know, it's actually a torso with arms and everything, and can do, it's very spectacular. And um, I, I think there is a future for it, uh, because there's many bays you can uh, put it with. You, know, you can just attach it to the Canada or the space station. You can attach it to a rover base as well. Uh, it can actually move its, by itself just by floating in the space station. And when we were also discussing the New Year's design, we're, we thought to ourselves, why if why shouldn't we have two arms, maybe on the rover? And why shouldn't we have the, the user inside, you know, have maybe sensors on its arm and actually just doing the task on its own? It would be much more uh, easier for the controller to do it, much more intuitive. Uh, so there's, there's definitely a, a future for it, uh, I would think. Uh, maybe not for the University of Robert Challenge next year, but that's another aspect we'll be working on, the uh, human and computer interaction, for example, having an Oculus Rift to look around, not necessarily having cameras on board it moving as we're moving because there's a lag and it makes the driver dizzy, but actually building a whole 360 degree view environment. And this is the environment you're looking at, and it's not laggy at all. So some of the features will work next year. Yeah? Wow. <laughs> But you can actually like sense the, sense. yeah, right. within the, yeah. Like when you're thinking about the you have a sense of, uh, yeah, a, 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 a mini discharge sense, yeah. The thalamic labs that have it, and then the hollow um, technology, which might be a nice alternative where you're creating that piece. Yes, actually, yeah, that could be a thing. So we'll, we'll write it down, actually, it's actually after. Yeah. Amazing, amazing. Okay. Thank you. Yes? I have yeah. Uh, one about the whole <laughs> Yes. So um, for the cost question, uh, the, the challenge limits us to $15,000 US for the value of whatever you're bringing over. Um, if we have things, if we're obtaining things for free donations, we have to document it to the right value. So if we get discounts, we can actually put the discounted value. So this one was very close to the actual $15,000 US limit. It was $14,000 something, uh, $18,200 in Canadian. I can, I can recall. But we've done a lot of prototypes before. And there's, but there's some material we got discounted from companies. Uh, there's some other materials we had to pay for. So in the end, we spent uh, the whole value of what we've played with this year was about $25,000, uh, we would say. Uh, yeah. And to answer, your second question was on the timeline, how much time it took us to actually build this, right? Yeah, OK. So um, we have seven, seven months maximum to get to the University Rover Challenge. So uh, getting everything together the uh, first time was done, uh, well, 
maybe 75% of it was done before um, mid-March, which is the date where we have to hand in our critical design review so that the URC judges can look at it and decide whether, yes, this team is, uh, would be ready to participate in May or no, this team shouldn't be participating for X, Y reason um, to be selected. But have the whole system assembled like at 100% uh, probably happened a week and a half before going to competition. We, we unit tested everything because you can, you can just follow a specific process behind it. For example, when you have your drive system ready, just let the ARM section just work on their own, get it ready, and then just integrate it to the rest of the system together. So as a full 100% system, maybe uh, two weeks before leaving for competition. Yes? This one here? No, it's only uh, one camera. Uh, one of the things we're, we'll try to do next year is that this has a very limited angle of view. And this camera is one of the only USB cameras you could find that had an optical zoom inside. So it's very useful if we have to zoom in onto a specific soil area we'd like to collect our, dust, uh, our, our sample from. Um, what we'd like to do next year is to have an actual camera that looks upwards of, uh, to a comical mirror. And on, with just one uh, camera feed, you ca have kind of a bubble image of your surrounding. And with the software, you can unwrap this and have a 360 degree views environment. And this is what we'd like to do next year. Um, 3D could be actually very useful because for the service panel task, it's very hard to determine you know, your distance to the panel task. Uh, we could have 3D cameras. We could have, I don't know, sensors that could tell us the distance to the, to the, uh, to the panel. We also had algorithms. Uh, we had to change a lot of our software. Uh, competition, we couldn't use it there. But we had algorithms, which was uh, a lot created by Miles here. Um, which was able to operate the arm in a Cartesian plan if we wanted it to, so it would stay at the same distance from the panel, or also in a spherical way. So we had different control systems. Uh, but yeah, 3D could be, could be a thing. Yes? 